Welcome to the Drum Shuffle, a podcast offering insights, perspectives, and conversations for drummers. I'm your host, Jamie Eads. Hey, how's it going out there, everybody? Welcome to the Drum Shuffle. Jamie Eads joining you as always. This is episode 51. I hope everybody's having a fantastic week out there. We have a fantastic show for you today. Uh, I had the great honor of being joined by Dina Torriello uh, back right before Christmas, and we're going to bring you her interview here in just a moment. So stay tuned after this message from Los Cabos Drumsticks. The best kept secret for drummers is finally out. Los Cabos Drumsticks may look like the sticks you grew up with, but these are not your father's drumsticks. Los Cabos Drumsticks is Canada's number one drumstick brand, and they are coming to a retailer near you. With operations in over 28 countries worldwide, thousands of drummers have already discovered the Los Cabos difference. Using FSC certified wood from Canada and the U.S., Los Cabos make the finest quality drumsticks, percussion tools, and accessories on the market. The best news, Los Cabos Drumsticks offers you a ton of choice. They have 22 individual drumstick models and 14 percussion tools, many of which are available in three different wood types, maple, white hickory, and red hickory. Red hickory comes from the center, or heart, of the hickory tree and has been independently proven to be both stronger and more elastic than white hickory without adding a lot of weight. While most drumstick manufacturers have shunned red hickory, Los Cabos Drumsticks has embraced it, becoming the only established stick brand in the world to offer a full line of red hickory drumsticks. To learn more about Los Cabos Drumsticks, visit them online at loscabosdrumsticks.com, follow them on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and don't forget to ask for Los Cabos Drumsticks at your favorite retailer. Dare to be different. Join the Red Hickory Revolution with Los Cabos Drumsticks. All right, everybody. As I mentioned, we are going to be joined by the great Dina Torriello here in just a moment. Dina is just a monster player. Um, She just wrapped up about a week and a half ago a run with the Broadway musical Head Over Heels. Uh, being in the pit every night, uh, doing that fantastic show up in New York City. Uh, Dina also spent uh, several years in the critically acclaimed band Antigone Rising. Uh, She is just a fantastic human being and a monster player, somebody that everybody should know. Uh, And if you do know Dina, you just automatically love her because she's just so kind and so cool. So please help me welcome to the drum shuffle, Dina Torriello. Hey, good afternoon, Dina. How's it going? Good. How are you? I am doing fantastic. Thanks for asking. Uh, Thanks so much for taking the time to come on the drum shuffle. We really do appreciate it. No, thanks for having me. Oh, we be here. Yeah, we're honored to have you on the show. Um, Dina, I know you're at least somewhat familiar with our format. Um, Let's start at the beginning. Um, Mm -hmm. Young Dina in New Jersey. (laughs) (laughs) How did you end up as a drummer? Well, um, my my parents, who between them had not an ounce of musical ability, (laughs) were nonetheless... uh, um, avid music fans. They listen to a lot of different things that, you know, certainly is not cool by our standards um, (laughs) or certainly not for most kids, but I was, I was really young and uh, you know, we'd get put in the car to go on drives to wherever. And I I know I'm totally dating myself, but we had an eight track player in the car. Oh, that's awesome. um, Everybody had an eight track player in in our generation, right? Yeah, it was great. So they would let us, you know, choose on each trip, you know, what we wanted to listen to. And one of the, one of the artists in their rotation was the Carpenters, Karen and Richard Carpenter, Karen being a drummer. I got, I, I, you know, initially I didn't realize she was a drummer. I just really loved her voice and I liked the music a lot. And then 
um, became pretty obsessed with them in general, got my first album, which was a Carpenter's album, probably when I was maybe five or six for Christmas. And soon discovered through the liner notes that Karen was the drummer on the album. And I was like, oh, wow, she's a drummer. That's awesome, you know. And then they came around in concert a year or two later. My mom got us tickets and went to the show. And not only did I get to actually see her, you know, live in action doing solos and doing all kinds of really cool stuff, but my dad, you know, sweet-talked the security guard, basically, and got us backstage, and I got to meet them. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was it was pretty amazing. I was standing in their dressing room, like, oh... <laughs> losing my mind very calmly. Um, it was really incredible. And so that was before their show. And then I went back out to my seat and watched the show. And I vividly remember watching Karen play and thinking to myself, I want to do that. Yeah. That's what I want to do. So I started harassing my parents for drum lessons. And, you know, I, I think initially they thought and probably certainly hoped that it was a passing phase. <laughs> and when it didn't, when it didn't, it didn't go away for her, the better part of the, the year that followed, they were finally like, all right, already, leave me alone. I'll get you. Drum <laughs> so I studied with, uh, with a local guy from the age of eight until 16. And it was solely from, from seeing Karen Carpenter play and being inspired by her. Oh, man, that's, that's awesome. But I mean, you yeah. know, it just goes to show you what, what a different time we live in now, because that would be unheard of, you know, to, yeah. to, to make your way backstage to, you know, meet somebody that would be so influential. I mean, it just would not happen in this day no. and age. So possible. You could be lucky. You could even get to the, talk to the security card, let alone have the security card and let you backstage. Exactly. Thankfully for, for me, you know, Karen was a sucker for kids. I mean, she loved kids and, um, you know, as my dad tells the story, I don't remember the details because I was only seven, but <clears throat> as my dad tells the story, he he had come home from work with flowers for me to give to Karen. And off we went to the concert, and I'm, you know, walking around with my little bouquet of flowers, and he went up to the security guard and said, um, you see those two kids over there? You know, those are my kids, and, you know, my daughter has flowers that she really wants to give to Karen, and I, I don't want to make your job any more difficult. You know, I don't know if she goes up to the stage, if it's going to create a problem. You know, is there any way you could, you know, you could get there? He's like, let me, let me check. And he went and asked, and the answer was yes. I mean, it, literally, that's how simple it was. And again, wow. yes, you know could never happen now. And it's a testament to how long ago that was, that that was even a possibility. And thank God for that. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, I, you know, I never ask a lady her age, but <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we are of the same vintage. I, I will just say that. The same vintage. I yes, like that. <laughs> we, we are of the same vintage. Um, but you know, Karen Carpenter, you, you know, I, th I think it's interesting because she was one of the first, you know, I guess, widely recognized female drummers. And I, I'm sure at the time that you were asking your parents, hey, I want to be a drummer, I want to be a drummer, it probably wasn't what a lot of young girls were doing at that time. You know what I mean? Definitely, definitely not. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, being that they were the most commercially success successful American music act of the 70s, they certainly had tons of exposure. Everybody knew who they were. And I think, well, I, I seriously wish I had a dollar for every person. I've told this story and, and the response was, oh, I didn't know she was a drummer. Oh, my God. You know, it, it's yeah, yeah. I mean, some drummers and but mostly just, you know, lay people, music fans, whatever, but somebody that, you know, doesn't necessarily know anything about the instrument or, you know, other drummers. Nobody, I shouldn't say nobody, but many people, you know, haven't, didn't realize that she was a drummer. So, you know, then you think, well, how much exposure did she really get? Even though the band was really well known, you know, unless you saw them in concert because MTV didn't exist and there was really no, you know, opportunity or reason for them to have a lot of live coverage, you know? So right. how many people really knew? I guess it kind of makes sense. But yes, you know, she was certainly one of the early pioneers and, you know, if I'm being honest, as much as I certainly had, have had bumps in the road in my career, you know, minor obstacles, maybe just for my gender, my parents, God bless them, never said, 
well, that's not a suitable instrument for a girl, or you can't play drums because you're a girl, and neither did my, my teacher in, in grammar school. Right you know, on. I never heard that from anybody. I never heard, oh, you know, you can't do that because you're a girl. And the kids in school were a different story. Oh, you're a drummer? You're a girl. You play drums? You know, it was more more of a, a surprise, almost a little bit of teasing. But, you know, people of authority weren't telling me, no, you can't do that. My mother, God rest her soul, allowed my band, any garage band I was in, they would roll the amps into my house. We would move the furniture in the dining room and we would set up <laughs> and have rehearsals for my cover band in my house, you know, and she would just go in the bedroom and turn the TV on as loud as she could put it and try to pretend she didn't have to listen to like Black Sabbath <laughs> and whatever else we were doing, you know? Oh, I, so. I, do, I do know because you just explained my childhood <laughs> perfectly. <laughs> um, you know, I, it, same thing, you know, um, my mom, you know, past this year or in 2018. Oh, I'm so sorry. And, you know, it, but it was really cool. She was a nurse and, you know, that's something that we have in common with that I have in common with RJ, you know, which is, RJ, yeah. Yeah. Which is kind of how you and I got hooked up. But, um, you know, she was a nurse and she would work a 12 hour shift and then come home to, you know, five hooligans in her basement, you know, <laughs> rocking. And, you know, I, I think, that just it's a testament to you know i guess our parents can tell if we're going to stay into whatever it is whether it's you know skateboarding playing a, a musical instrument you know whatever the case may be your parents mm -hmm. just know you know and, and and they're willing to let uh, i think good parents are willing to let their kids express themselves however and you know sure. what a testament to your parents that they didn't say well, you know, you're a girl, you probably shouldn't be a drummer. I mean, that's when I hear things like that, I just get angry. It's ridiculous. You know, who who cares? Yeah. You know, it, none yeah. of that stuff should matter. And, you know, what a career you have had and are still having. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, Thank you. Uh, you. Well, you're welcome. Um, you're just doing so much cool stuff out there. But, you know, you were talking about, you know, some of your first cover bands you know, talk to us about that. You took lessons, you know, up until the age of 16 or whatever. Did you, you know, were you forming, you know, garage bands all along the way? And I, I mean, what was your foray into, you know, being a gigging drummer? Um, I did my first, I was never a band leader per se. I didn't, I didn't put the bands together. I just sort of got asked along the way to, to jump in and play with a, a variety of bands. I think I think my first band, I think I was 12 when I was in my first band. And I actually did my first paying gig within that year. Oh, and wow. I know, I know. And I, was, I can remember it. I was um, the same age as the younger sister uh, of my guitar player. So she and I were in the, same, in the same class, but all the guys in the band were all like juniors and seniors in high school. And I was in, I think I was going into eighth grade or something like that. So there was, a, you know, quite that's, for that time period, you know, when you're that young, when you're that age, those few years are like big years, you know? Oh yeah. So it was kind of weird, but they, you know, they loved having me and it, it was a blast anyway. So she brought, she brought in an envelope, to, you know, to pay me. And I was, I, I remember opening, standing in front of my locker in middle school and opening the envelope and counting the money and being like, wow, <laughs> <laughs> this is great. And I think, I don't know. I don't know why this number sticks with me, but I think it was thirty-eight dollars. I don't know why I think that number, but that's what's in my head. So I want to say that was my first my first payday. Well, man, that's drummer. that's amazing. I'm still making thirty-eight dollars <laughs> a gig to this day. You know, <laughs> but but you know, I mean, it it's. I think it's amazing. And I think, you know, my first paying gig, I was probably 13 or 14 or something like that, you know, and it was a friend's birthday party, you know, you know, those kind of things that, that mm -hmm, happen sure. when you're, when you're of that age, but it puts you on, you know, I, I jokingly say the road to ruin at an early age, you figure <laughs> out, oh my God, this thing that I love more than anything, I can make money doing it. Now, mm -hmm. $38 to 12 year old Dina was, you know, that was good money. And I jokingly said, I still make $38, you know, to, to this day, but it's not much more than that. Let's be honest, right? If you're playing a, a bar gig in a cover band, 
you know, uh-huh. a couple hundred bucks for the weekend is great money, at least yeah. in my area, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think it just, we do it because we love it, but the money is cool too, right? I mean, and, and you, then you keep chasing that, that dream, right? I think so. I mean, for me, I don't know that it was that much of of an intentional or conscious thing. You know, when I got the money, it was sort of like, oh, and I can get, and I got paid for this. Like I had so much fun and I got paid. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like my thought process was never, well, how much money can I make doing this? And how much, you know, you know, how can I make this, you know, a full-time thing financially? I don't think my brain ever really went there, not in my early years anyway. I mean, you know, when you start carving out or trying to carve out a career for yourself, you know, you kind of have to split your brain in half between the creative side and the business side and and kind of figure all that out so that you can function, you know, and you can survive and how, you know, what is that going to look like for you? Am I going to be a part-time drummer? Am I going to have, you know, a corporate gig and play on the weekends? Or am I going to really commit and do this thing full time? And, you know, all, all that stuff that we have to negotiate. But, um, early on, it really was just, you know, chasing the love, the love of it, you know, and just the opportunities to play. And, and it really, you know, being in those bands with those guys that I was with back in, in those early years really exposed me to music that I wasn't listening to and that I didn't really know about. So that was another extra bonus. It just, you know, broadened my musical horizons in ways that, you know, I wasn't even aware of at the time, you know, all of a sudden I'm like, you know, listening to stuff that brought me to other stuff that brought me to other stuff. And, you know, there you are, you know, now, you know, all this cool stuff <laughs> that you never knew about before. A- absolutely. So, absolutely. And all the, all the great drum parts that went along with it, you know, and then you start, you know, I mean, you know what it's like if you, if you've been in cover bands, you know, you copy, you, you copy what they're doing and you learn. And, you know, I've worked with other musicians who really sort of turn their nose up at the idea of doing cover bands and, I understand that, you know, if you're a songwriter and you take your craft really seriously, the idea of of always imitating someone else's can maybe feel demeaning or feel like, you know, you're not, you're not thriving at your craft or whatever the case may be. But for me, I always looked at it as an opportunity to always learn and do the best job I could mimicking those parts. And you know, I've heard other drummers out there in the world, you know, you, you just happen to go out one night to have dinner and have a drink or whatever, and there happens to be a cover band. So you hear random people doing their interpretation of what a cover band sounds like. And I was out not that long ago down in South Jersey, and there was there was a guy who had, you know, decent chops, and he made it be known about every four bars because he couldn't <laughs> stop himself. He was filling all over the place. He just couldn't help himself. It was like a Tourette's episode with drum fills. He just, every two seconds, he was just like vomiting all over, all over the songs. And, you know, that's not your job. Right. Your job is to play the song, you know, and I took that very seriously. I would, I would learn the parts. I always felt like as a drummer, you know, learning these songs that the way that you listen to a song's melody and you hear a hook in there, I heard hooks in drum fills. I heard hit hooks in drum parts and, that was your job was to sort of replicate that and to, to serve that to those people who may be in tune to that. Cause I'd hate going to concerts and you see some of your favorite bands and like they, they throw away the melody line or they don't give you that melody line that you're used to hearing, or the drummer doesn't do the classic fill that you've heard on the record a million times, you know? So I feel like your ears are, you're used to that. And that's kind of what the listener is waiting for and expecting. And it's your job to kind of do that. So I always took that really seriously as part of my craft. And then in doing that, you develop this whole other, as Weckl would say, vocabulary, right, of all this other stuff um, that now you know how to do that maybe you didn't know before you learned how to play those songs. You know, so it's all part of the learning process. Yeah. And, and, you know, you took the words out of my mouth. It is a vocabulary because... You know, as drummers, you know, I can say to you, okay, you know, play 16 bars and then you do, you know, a a, a 16th note triplet fill or or whatever, you know, and and you know what I'm talking about. Guitar players will go, hey, can you do the fill from Tom Sawyer right here? You know what I mean? Or, or, or can you give me the, you know, the, the John Bonham shuffle kind of thing? That's how 
other musicians, non-drummers, talk to drummers. They go, here's what mm-hmm. I'm hearing. You know, I'm hearing the mm-hmm. Alex Van Halen thing from, from you know, I'll wait, or, or whatever the case right. may be. And right, right. That is... That is our dictionary, you know, that, that we, that we have to know. And that's a great point. That's awesome. Yeah, definitely. Because, you know, non-drummers can't explain, Hey, here's what I hear for this song I just wrote. And, you know, I, I just think it's playing in cover bands as most of us do at some point, you know, some people are lucky and they just latch onto a songwriter at a very early age and and they kind of do their own thing. But for those of us that have to play those cover gigs and there's nothing wrong with it at all, it it develops a muscle memory, a vocabulary, whatever you want to call it. But essentially, you're learning somebody else's chops to help you develop your own, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. And perhaps a different creative sensibility. You know, I mean, you know, you, you kind of, you have your own thing. Everybody has their own style, has their own interpretation, their own feel, their own thing that they put on a song. If, if you're, if you're in an original project, you know, and, and maybe by learning someone else's parts or someone else's, you know, whatever it is, whether it's a fill or or a part or whatever, you know, you're going to approach things in a different way. Your head kind of goes in a different, in different place, potentially, instead of doing, you know, maybe the, the, you might fall in a, a spectrum from A to A to you know D, you know, more often than not in terms of what you come up with. But now maybe because you've learned a certain drummer's work, maybe now you're going to go to like F, you know, or you're going to go to G, or you're going to go wherever you're going to go. You're going to open that up some more and and just get a little more creative, you yeah, know. I, yeah, there's no doubt about it. And you know, I mean, it's kind of funny when I listen back to to original projects that I recorded 20 years ago. I will listen to a part that I played and I'll go, oh man, that was a blatant rip off of <laughs> insert, yep. you know, insert whatever name in the blank. And it's, um, you know, I, I mean, I just think that's how we develop as uh, our own voices. And, you know, speaking of which, um, I, I do want to at least, you know, before we get into all the cool stuff that you're doing, you know, right now, I want to talk a little bit about Antigon Rising. Um, Antigone. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My, That's okay. Uh, that, That's okay. Uh, all right. I'm just repeating what RJ said, so I'm going to blame RJ. So <laughs> you should. Okay. <laughs> but I do. I, I want to talk about that particular group because you guys started playing in like the late '90s. I want to say, and I, I may get this wrong, so correct wherever I mess up here. But you guys were, I, I want to say, on Atlantic Records. Yes. Okay. And you guys were playing a lot. I mean, yes. many, <laughs> many, many dates. Talk to me a little yeah. bit about that group and, and how that came together because you guys were just monsters, you know? Thank you. Uh, yeah, we we had about a, almost a three-year clip of about 260 shows a year. For, for each of the, those three years, back wow. to back to back. So it was, it was intense, to say, to say the least. Um, I got into the band, um, a, a bass player that I had been working with in a New Jersey cover project was the bass player of the band at the time. And uh, <clears throat> the, the band was undergoing a little bit of a lineup change. Uh, Kristen Henderson, who was the band's drummer at the time, was coming out front to play rhythm guitar and sing backing vocals. So they wanted to get a drummer in there to take over for her. And the bass player recommended that, you know, to give me a lesson. So I got brought in for an audition and I got the gig. And that was just, it was just about 20 years ago. It was 1998. Oh, okay. And the band, the band, they formed the band in college. So, I mean, years before, you know, a couple of years before that. And then, you know, uh, member changes and, and so forth. But the band that did the touring and did all that crazy stuff essentially was the band that got signed. We were signed to Lava initially. Uh, Lava started as an imprint of Atlantic and then it was its own thing. And then they disintegrated Lava and they took some of the, a handful maybe of their bands from Lava and brought them back over to Atlantic 
and we were one of those bands. But the one major release that that we did put out was through Lava, and it was it was on Lava, but it was released through Starbucks. And we were the first band to be featured in their Hear Music debut series. Oh, really? So what they that's, yeah what they were awesome. doing is they were taking bands that were signed but widely unknown and trying to use that as a, as a platform to help break the band. So we were played in, in every, pretty much every Starbucks throughout the country. Yeah. And they had like a little cardboard cutout on the counter, like a little display, and they were playing the CD in the stores. And we sold, God, I think our first week, we sold over 12,000 for a new band is like a tremendous amount of sales in one week. You know, I think we sold upwards of 250,000 copies. And most of that was, we ended up going to, to all major retail some months later, but initially it was for Starbucks only as a release in Starbucks only. So most of the sales were from Starbucks. Wow. And it was shortly thereafter that, you know, after they kept that series for a short time that they, that they began their own label and they started doing like the heavy music thing, but we were on the front end of all that. And, um, you know, it was, I believe a result of all the touring that we did. And unfortunately we didn't really make a lot of money doing the touring that we did because we were all over the place and constantly on the road and trying to build and trying to build and trying to build. And, um, you know, we'd sell merch, we were, you know, gaining a following, we were doing all the things that you need to do, but most importantly, we were becoming a kick-ass band. <laughs> I mean, we just, we got so tight. I mean, you can't play that many shows and not, right? right? And, you know, the girls were really honing their craft as songwriters and really writing great stuff. And, you know, we were just, we became, you know, a five-headed monster. You know, we were just a well-oiled machine and, you know, just were pounding it, just grinding it out. And um, we we went into the studio to do a kind of a high-end demo with a producer by the name of Michael Barbiero. Oh, wow. That's a big name. Okay. Yeah. And uh, he ultimately got it to Jason Flom at Lava, and that's kind of how the connection happened. And, you know, Michael just really believed in us. You know, as he told us, you know, at the time, he never once brought any of the projects that he worked with to Jason. You know, he wasn't that guy to do that. But he thought that we were really worthy, and he felt really strongly about what we had and the songs and the, you know, the ability of, of the musicianship and all that kind of stuff. And, and he wanted Jason to hear it. And, you know, very soon after that, Jason came to see us live and, you know, we signed the band. He signed the band. I think we were in his, his office like the next day having wow. a meeting, you know, it was like, bam, it just happened. Yeah. Overnight success. No, just kidding. Yeah. So, but uh, I mean, Jason Flom, I mean, it, <laughs> it, you know, for, for those that don't know uh, in 1998, I mean, I guess he was just coming off like Hootie and the Blowfish and, uh, you know, I, whose debut album sold what, you know, 14 million copies. Or, million. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but Jason yeah, Flom. He signed Matchbox 20, he signed Jewel, he signed Kid Rock, he signed, I mean, yeah, I mean you know. everything he touches, it seems like turns <clears throat> to, to platinum, not gold, but mm -hmm. uh, you, you know what I mean? So it's just, <laughs> mm -hmm. that's amazing. And I, yeah. I know you guys, you guys opened for just like pretty much the first page of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees, right? I mean, you guys. Yeah, some, some of those. Um, yeah. We had a few, Aerosmith, Rolling Stones, Allman Brothers. Well, you Same know, you, yeah. I, I mean, good. I know all of my guests have had opening slots for the Rolling Stones and Aerosmith, <laughs> you know, so um, how crazy is that, man? I mean, yeah, it was pretty awesome. I, I mean, at, at that point, you have to say, yeah, I'm done. I, I can die happy, right? Well, <laughs> you know, it's yes and no. You know, for me, there have been a lot of things that have interested me in terms of a career in music. You know, it wasn't one of them is to play Madison Square Garden. I still haven't done that. So, so no, I can't quit yet. I got okay. to get to the garden. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, yeah, I'm sure it's only a matter of time. Me, uh, well, let's hope. But um, the this, this show with the Stones was in two. We did three. Two of them were at the United Center in Chicago. And then one was in Baltimore. And I was like, oh, man, why couldn't it be the garden? I want to see the garden. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. And then Aerosmith was South Jersey. It was the uh, Art Center 
the PNC Bank Art Center, and um, I think we did the Trump Taj Mahal in Atlantic City. So, uh, yeah, got to work on the garden thing. But anyway, um, I'm being a wise guy. Um, you know, there's other things that I wanted to do, and, you know, recently with the opportunity to do Head Over Heels on Broadway, that was that was a big bucket list thing for me was to was to kind of crack the Broadway thing. So, you know, I think as as we grow older, as we age, just the natural part of the process is, you know, we're always sort of taking taking inventory and, you know, what have we done? What do we want to still do? You know, where can we be better? How can we imp- improve? And how can we achieve? You know, what's you know what's still left to achieve? You know, how do we get there? So. Yeah, it's kind of a fluid process for me. Well, you know, you mentioned head over heels and, you know, by the time this episode airs, you guys will have done your your final show. Um, but yes. I, I want to make sure everybody knows what head over heels uh, is. And, and, you know, it's the music of the Go-Go's, um, which, you know, I, I think goes without saying uh, just an awesome band. You know, everybody knows the music of the Go-Go's, but um, I I think it was Entertainment Weekly said it was, you know, one of their top 10 picks in terms of, you know, shows to go see. It's just been massively successful. And I know that it's it's high pressure to do a a Broadway gig as as a musician um, in, in any format. But you guys are actually on stage playing. You know, you're not in the pit. And, and, you know, so talk to me a little bit about that gig. How how high pressure is it for you? Well, you're partly right. The band, there is a reveal at the end of the show. So uh, I played the show in a pit by myself. I was all alone in what I affectionately refer to as the bomb shelter, because the, the pit in this particular theater, uh, the Hudson Theater, is one of Broadway's smallest theaters. Um, as such, they don't tend to do a lot of musicals. They're geared a little more inherently for, you know, for dramas. Right. And so the pit doesn't get a lot of action. So it's not a traditional pit. You know, most pits, there's like the opening, you know, the traditional thing where the conductor would sort of stand and kind of see the stage and still be in the pit and all that. You know, there's no opening. It's completely bricked in. (laughs) It's just a brick room. So uh, there I was all by myself. And towards the end of the the second act, there's uh, a 12 measure break and a little dialogue that would give me just enough time to run up two flights of stairs and join the rest of the band on a platform hidden behind a scrim. And then for the final, the the bows, when the bows would happen, the scrim would go up and it would be revealed to the audience that it's an all female band. So that was kind of the, the cherry on top of the show because the show was so beautiful in that it's, you know, it's a story of love and acceptance and it's, it's a mashup in the most beautiful way. Uh, the music of the Go-Go's, which has nothing, the story has nothing to do with the Go-Go's. It's just their music, right. which help, helps tell the story really beautifully. And it's, it's got, you know, um, a non-binary, you know, transgender character. It has, you know, a, a gay couple It ha- you know, all these, all these contemporary themes and, and, and things, you know, but yet it's, it was set in, um, Elizabethan era. It was the 1600s, you know? So it was like this, the costuming and the staging, super beautiful and, and just, you know, and I think people maybe had a hard time getting their head around what the show was going to be about. But once they got into the theater, they just loved it. It was, it was really, really, really awesome, really special. And like I said, the all-female band, I think, was, you know, was something that they really reacted to. So that was cool. Um, as far as the pressure component of all of that, I think for me, you know, sometimes it happens this way with Broadway shows. You get to be in the rooms and the rehearsals. Oftentimes they want the drums in there because it's, you know, integral in getting the choreography sorted out. You know, there are changes that need to be made. There are accents that have to happen. Symbol crashes, tom hits, whatever it might be. 
to support the choreography. So it's often the MD who's pretty much always a pianist and then the drummer in the, you know, in the rooms working through everything with everyone and, you know, putting it all together. So it really allowed me the opportunity to get comfortable with the process, with the parts, with the people, you know, being in there six days a week from the end of February until the end of March. And then we went to San Francisco when I was there for six weeks with them. And then we came to Broadway. So, you know, I had a lot of time to acclimate. And I think had I not had that much time to acclimate, it could have been a little more stressful than it was. You know, I felt relatively comfortable. Obviously I was a little stressed out of the gate because it was my first show, but, um, you know, you, you quickly realize that in live theater, mistakes happen Mis- because there's so many moving parts. And I don't just mean, you know, musically they happen, but things can go wrong. Yeah. You know, there's prop malfunctions and there's, you know, they're just lighting malfunctions or, oh my gosh, last week, um, <laughs> we were doing, we were doing the show and the cameras went out. So I'm in a pit all by myself. <laughs> and you can't see anything. <laughs> and I lost the conductor feed. I couldn't see the conductor. <laughs> now I'm doing a show that requires, you know, cues from the conductor and I can't see anything. That was a little stressful. But even, even that in the moment, because I had been playing the show for so long, I was relatively okay. As soon as the show ended, I, I felt like I, I needed a stiff drink. But in the moment... I was, I held it together remarkably well. I was very, I was very proud of myself. Yeah. But, uh, you know, so once you wrap your head around the fact that, you know, perfection is a very high expectation in, in this environment, it kind of makes a little more sense to you and you can be a little more forgiving and, you know, you might not nail every, every button, every, every cue, every down, but, you know, it's hard, you know, because the conductor is giving you cues based upon things that are happening on stage. And sometimes that changes from night to night. So then the conductor cue changes or the actors don't do it in a clear enough way so that the MD, you know, the conductor can see it happening. So you get a really short late cue and you've got to jump right in and, you know, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. So you have to just really be on your toes and be comfortable with your charts. And, you know, it's definitely more helpful if you have it in, ingrained a little more. So you're not reading all the time. I mean, you have the charts for reference, but once you kind of get to know them, then you can spend more time focusing on the MD and the cues and less time with your eyes on the, on the book, you know, and that, that's what can make it an easier process. Truthfully. Yeah. Well, I mean, anytime you have, you know, a, a Broadway or, you, you know, even if you're in the pit for, you know, I don't know, like the, the Academy Awards, you know, they always have a band for mm-hmm. that. You know, those are not mail it in gigs. You you have to be <laughs> fully awake. <laughs> yeah. For yeah. The in- Lots of coffee. Yes. Absolutely. Um, you know, you, because as you say, things change all the time. And, it, you know, I, I guess it's, that way in rock and roll as well, you know, just kind of a concert kind of setting, but you know, I, I'll be the first to admit, I'll take a song off mentally. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, mm-hmm. I, I don't have to think about this, you know? Um, so I've always been envious of you guys that do the, the, the Broadway shows. And I know that it's high pressure and high stakes every single day, you know, and yeah. it's, um, you know, kudos to you. And, um, you know, I know it was a great run. What, you know, what is going to happen next now that that show has ended? Are you looking for another kind of, uh, Broadway gig or are you ready to get back out on the road or, or what's next for Dina? Uh, I think Broadway is going to, is going to stay, you know, in my world. I think that's what's going to happen. Um, I would like it to happen. And, um, you know, there's been communications with, with people out there in the world and, you know, who are in making, in charge of making these decisions. And, you know, everyone knows that I'm available and interested and, you know, ready to jump in and, and get to work on another show. So, you know, I'm, I'm confident that I'll have the opportunity to do that again. I hope. Yeah. That's, you know, it was, it was truly, the most remarkable experience of my career. It really has been 
you know, you were joking about the gig with the Stones. Like at that point, am I ready to say, okay, I'm done? <laughs> I feel more that way after this than I did opening for the Stones. Well, that's like, cool. I mean, that's yeah. I, that, that speaks volumes. I mean, that says a lot. And you know, I mean, if you were you know out on the road doing you know 270, you know 260 nights a year, uh, doing the Broadway thing, you get to sleep in your own bed every night. I mean, that's got to be yeah. cool, right? Yeah, I mean, there's so there's so many perks. Truly, you know, the show Head Over Heels was, you know, from start to finish, two hours and fifteen, two hours and twenty minutes, and that's you know relatively short by stand, you know, by most musicals. Some musicals are closer to three hours, but you know, generally never longer than that. So you're talking about quote unquote working no more than three hours a day, you know. But that being said. You know, in addition to your commute time and all that stuff, because you have to obviously build in a pretty good amount of time to get into Manhattan because, you know, you have to account for potential traffic issues and all that stuff because it's your job to be there, right? It's your responsibility. The show is supposed to go on. You're expected to be there. So you have to make sure that you're giving yourself ample time to account for some nonsense. So, you know, that adds a little bit to your day. And then sort of the mental component. You know, you mentioned the stress and the, you know, having to really be on and be focused. It's tiring. And Head Over Heels was a really, really physical show from the drum chair. I mean, they, one of, one of the themes of the, of the show, of the content of the show, they call, they kept talking about the beat. So the town, you know, could lose their beat, so to speak. You know, they sort of likened their, their, um, you know, their pulse and their energy and the, the rhythm of their, of their culture to the beat, quote unquote, right? right? So that was obviously, you know, enhanced and sort of made really obvious through the, dr- the drum chair. You know, and you, you, know, you know, the music of the go-go's obviously, every, you know, it's really up-tempo and it's, it's sort of loud and it's kind of in your face and, you know, all that. And this show was no different. So I was hitting really hard for the entirety of the show. And the, the mental component in conjunction with the physical aspect, it made me tired. You know, I'd walk out of there and I'd be beat. So being able to come home and sleep in your own bed is, is definitely a huge advantage. And, you know, your life isn't disrupted. You know, it's really hard. As much as I love being on the road, and I really do, and I loved it for all the years that I did it, it's hard. You know, it takes a toll on your body and it's very disruptive, obviously, to your life and, you know, your relationships and all that kind of stuff. So, I think, again, the older we get, you know, the more you sort of reevaluate and take stock in things and think maybe maybe it's not the best thing to be doing all the time. You know, everything in moderation, right? Isn't that what they say? That's, that is <laughs> what they say. I'll, I'll tour in moderation. Yeah. <laughs> I like doing some fly dates. You know, you're out and back. You're gone a week. You're gone a few days. You know, it's all good. But this, you know. 260 shows a year. Yeah, no. <laughs> I'm yeah, cool for that now. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I'm leaving for my tour. I'll see you in 10 months. Yeah, that's never, yeah, right? you know, that's never anything good to say. Um, no, no. Well, congratulations on a just a, a, a monster run of the show, um, you know, and, and we'll be looking for you on a, on a new Broadway show real soon. Now, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit because I, I have okay. to talk about this as well. You've been doing some some work with Rob Thomas, you know, mm-hmm. famously from Matchbox Twenty and the the RT Quartet. Um, how often are you guys playing, and and is that going to be an ongoing thing in your life? Uh, and tell us a little bit about that because it's it's a really cool project. Oh, it's great. Um, it's. Speaking of fly dates, that's that's how that is set up. So that project doesn't tour. Um, you know, Rob is gearing up to release um, a solo record in the new year, and he has his nine-piece live band, essentially the same band that he's been with since he did his first solo record when I first met him in 2004, 2005. So that will be the band, you know, the members who go out on the road and, and do this thing with him to support that record. When he's not touring, he stays busy doing these acoustic dates, generally private, private things. Um, and they're fly dates all over the place. We've, you know, been, you know, all over the States, Toronto, you know, it just depends on, you know, who wants to bring him in and for what purpose, you know, and it's a stripped down version of 
his solo and some matchbox stuff. And, you know, it's really, it's really beautiful. It's really great. You know, it, you really get a sense of, of the songs because, you know, it's not about, not that his songs are about that anyway, but it's not about, you know, the arrangement per se or the instrumentation or, you know, what, what else, you know, any bells and whistles and production that, that are on there. It's about the songs and the songwriting and you really can, get inside of that and really hear it and feel it in the quartet, you know, in the stripped down versions of, of all the songs. It's really awesome. So it is something that you're going to continue doing yeah. into mm-hmm. the future. That's yep. that, it, it, it's, like I said, he's going to be, you know, he'll be with his, he'll be live supporting his record over the course of probably most of, if not all of the, the new year. So that, you know, he's not going to have time to do anything like that. It's going to be, you know, the, the live full band stuff. So, you know, I'll be on hiatus until he has the time to book those shows again. And then, you know, I'll go out again and, and resume. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, yeah, a- it's such a, it's such a pleasure because he's such a brilliant songwriter and such a nice guy. And it's just, it's such a great, you know, so, so much fun. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, I think, the thing about Rob and his music, and, and I can't remember, but I, I heard him do an interview on, uh, I want to say it was like Sirius XM or something a, a while back. And it was almost like his version of Storytellers, you know, mm-hmm. where he was talking about where all these songs came from. And it just gave me personally a new appreciation for all of that music, you, you know, mm-hmm. to, to kind of hear the stories behind it. And I'm sure the quartet, he, he does some of that, um, you yes, know, he does. banter between, between tunes. And I, you know, I think it would be really cool to see. So maybe I'll have you yeah, guys, he's great. have you guys come do like a coffee hour with me here at the drum shuffle studios sometime. Definitely. <laughs> Cause <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I can write a check big enough to get Rob Thomas here. So, uh, <laughs> sponsorships available folks. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> well, one more thing that I want to talk to you about, Dina, um, and I, you know, I want to be respectful of your time, but um, you're a certified drum therapist um, mm-hmm. with the, the Drums and Disabilities program. And I think that's just so cool. Tell us a little bit about that as well. The, the Drums and Disabilities program is based here in New Jersey. Pat Jeswaldo is the gentleman who uh, started that program, that organization. He's the president. And um, in order to become a certified drum therapist, you need to, you know, do classes with him. And he sort of, you know, walks you through um, a variety of things to do should you be working with students in this capacity. Um, I, he, I've worked with him specifically. There's a, there's a school in New Jersey um, that he usually will do a, a program as part of their curriculum, you know, like uh, schools will cycle through like, you know, for this quarter you have, you know, health and then next quarter you have whatever. And then next quarter you have drums, you know, you're going to do drumming. So this uh, fourth and fifth grade, I think I had for a couple of years. And, um, you know, typically he'll work with students uh, either on the spectrum. These kids are, more ADHD, maybe you get a little bit of oppositional defiance disorder or some, you know, something in that, in that world of the spectrum. But, you know, Pat's research has shown that, you know, drumming is very therapeutic, particularly in integrating the left and right brain. So getting everything to sort of function without any, any blockages, you know, and, you know, the, we know this just because we feel good when we drum, right? Yeah. But, you know, releasing endorphins and chemicals and, you know, I'm, I'm dumbing it down significantly, but that's, that's kind of the gist. Um, and it's really good for retention and getting them to focus. So you're asking them to do really specific things by way of drumsticks and a pad typically is, is how I would do it. And, you know, it really, they're interested in it, first of all, so they're more likely to focus. And then by giving them these specific tasks and these specific things, and you get them, they can do it, then they start to get successful, and then they, you know, want to do it more, and they pay more attention, you know, and it just, it, it's part of the therapeutic process for them. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I just, I've always said there's something about drumming 
that everybody should try it once. I mean, I, I honestly believe if everybody could sit down behind a kit and play for five minutes once in their life, the world would be full of drummers. There's nothing <laughs> like it. I mean, I, I don't know what it is, but you know, I've heard for years and years, and I know that, that you're taking on students and giving lessons, and we certainly want to, you know, guide some folks your way uh, for that. But, you know, I've heard people say to me my whole life, I'm not coordinated enough to be a drummer. And my answer is always, when you were born, you were not coordinated enough to walk or to run or to write or, or whatever the case may be. It, it, anybody that can count to four can at least start on this wonderful journey of uh, music that we call drumming. And, you know, I think it's really cool that you spend some time doing that. So kudos to you, Dina. Thank you. You're, Thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah, it's, it's like any skill, right? I mean, you know, if, if you love skiing, you can learn how to ski. It doesn't mean that you're going to be good enough to go compete in the Olympics or be a professional, but you can still do it and enjoy it. And I think, I think that's certainly true here. People just automatically assume, you know, it's funny people, people sort of react to it and think like, I don't know how you do that. I'm like, well, what do you think? I just put a pair of sticks in my hand and like, this is what came out of me. You know, you have to practice, you have to work on it. You know, yeah. just, you know, just like press a button and, <laughs> and it happens, you know? That's exactly you know, right. It's funny that way. And, and I, I think it's this weird thing where, because we're not playing in a key and there's no notes associated with what we're doing. I think in some respects, people expect it to be easier, you know, yeah. other than the coordination component. But I think that there's this, 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 you know, black mark over the drumming community that somehow we're lesser musicians because we're, you know, we're not creating a melody and we're not, you know, writing notes that have, you know, pitch value or anything like that. And we're playing notes like that. But, you know, then there's the whole coordination thing. <laughs> then well, there's that. <laughs> yeah, there, there is we definitely. Have our own, we, we have our own cross to bear. <laughs> That's exactly right. And, you know, I mean, I, I think you bring up a really good point. And, you know, I've I've heard every drummer joke in the world. You know, what do you call a guy that hangs out with musicians, a drummer? You know, I've, I mean, I've heard all those. But, you know, and, and drummers take part in those jokes. And we, we actually, you know, kind of had a little listeners poll way back when about this. And, and some people said, you know, it, it does. It really makes me angry when I hear that stuff and it gives us a bad name. And other people are like, no, man, it's funny. You know, <laughs> it's it's funny mm -hmm. to hear a good drummer's joke. But, you know, drummers have this this. I don't know if you would call it, I don't know, this fraternity, I guess. it's There is this brotherhood and sisterhood amongst us that is different than other musicians. I have yet to find another drummer that's not always willing to help out however possible. I totally agree. You know, I, I, there's, I totally agree. There's friendly competition amongst us, but you know, it's, uh, you know, and I've said this on this show a billion times and I, you know, I hate to sound like a broken record, but I will always say, Oh, you know, here's a, here's a chop that I ripped off from Dina. You know, I was watching Dina play and I stole this lick from Dina. Whereas a guitar player almost always says, no, 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 I invented that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's all me. <laughs> it, it's all me. Well, it, I mean, you're, you're, you're bringing up in a subtle way, I think a very, a very valid point. And, you know, I think if, if you look at each instrument, I mean, there's very distinct personalities that gravitate towards the instrument or, or as some believe calls the instrument to you, you know, it's like, do, do we choose the instrument or does the in instrument choose us, you know, kind of a thing. But, you know, I think, I think that's a very large part of it. You know, I think it's the personality type, you know, I, I very much, I'm very content to be behind my drums. I don't need to be out front. I don't need people to see me. I don't need to be soloing. I'm good. I'm good right where I am. <laughs> if I love, you know, if I love being flashy and soloing, maybe I'd be more likely to be a lead guitarist. I don't know, but it's not, it's not who I am. You know, I'm, I want to lay down a, a groove and do a part that's absolutely right for whatever song I'm playing and support whatever musical project I'm involved in. And that's my job. And I'm, I'm great with that. 
I don't need maybe twirling sticks. Not that if anybody out there does it, that's fine. It's just not my thing. You know, I don't want to be soloing. I don't, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good right where I am. <laughs> yeah, we're cut from the same cloth, Dina, no doubt about it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Dina, one of our traditions here on the drum shuffle is we ask all of our guests for a good piece of advice. And I think you probably have kind of a unique perspective here. You know, um, you've done the Broadway thing, which I think it it just takes the skill level up to a, to another notch, I think, or the required skill level. And we've talked about that a little bit, but um, you, you've just done so much amazing work in your career, and that's continuing, certainly. But share with us a good piece of advice for, for other drummers, other musicians. Mm, that's a great question. I, I would say, first and foremost, because I, I battle this occasionally in, in, my, in, my, in teaching, some of my students don't want to read. They sort of fight me on the reading thing. They just want to learn by ear. And I am vehemently opposed to that idea. You have to read. So if you guys are out there, girls out there playing by ear, watching YouTube videos and learning that way, it's awesome and continue to do that. But please, even on a, on a rudimentary level, learn how to read because you're, you're really doing yourself a disservice in terms of the type of work that you could potentially get by not being able to read, not being able to make yourself a chart, not being able to, you know, to function. Um, I'm doing a gig this Sunday, um, and I'm looking at lead sheets and piano vocals, and I'm making charts, and I'm, you know, I'm preparing to do this gig. And if you can't read, you you can't really, like, you're not going to be able to do stuff like that. And so you're really pigeonholing yourself. So that's first and foremost. I would say number two if I can give you a number two. Absolutely. Um, I shared, I share this with people occasionally, you know, I have kind of a little bit of a twisted sense of humor and I can be self deprecating. But one of the, one of the things I said about getting this, you know, finally getting a Broadway show after wanting to do it for so many years, um, either I'm an illustration of, you know, um, uh, just never giving up, right? Mm-hmm. Or being com- like a complete idiot. <laughs> Stupidity, <laughs> right? I've been, I just wouldn't take no for an answer. Not that I was getting no, but I wasn't, I wasn't having the opportunity, right? The opportunity hadn't come to me yet. And I just, I just didn't give up on it. I just never, I never said, oh, that's clearly not going to happen. I'm going to move away from that or I'm going to, do, do go to a plan B or a plan C or a plan D, you know? So, and I'm not a spring chicken. So, you know, I think if you really want something and it's really important to you, I think you should keep your energy in that and keep putting it out there and don't give up on it Yeah, because it can happen. Even when you think maybe it's too late or you're too old or the ship has sailed, you don't know when your someone's going to knock on your door and you're going to get that opportunity. Yeah, that's, yeah, I mean, what you just said, (laughs) you know, it's, (laughs) well, I mean, I think people, you know, I say all the time, rock and roll is a young man's game, you know, I mean, I, I, and I jokingly say that, and I say it in a self-deprecating way, you know, that, that I'm getting a little too old for this, but I continue to be prepared, right, because, absolutely, Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, A very, very good drummer, uh, Rod Morgenstein, one of my favorites of all time, said on this very show, he said, luck favors the prepared, Jamie. And, you know, so you stay prepared for whatever opportunity comes your way, um, but you have to chase it because this is a business full of no's. I I mean, it's just a business full of no's. And if you take those personally, and let it get you down, you won't know how to react when you get the yes. Hmm. You know? Right. So you, you have to keep that in perspective. But great Absolutely. advice. Great advice from you, Dina. We, we appreciate it. Um, thank you so much for taking time to do this. I know you actually um, have a show tonight. So thank you very, very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on the drum shuffle. It goes without saying, you're welcome here anytime. 
Um, give us your web address uh, so people can find you out there on the on the internet. It is simply my name, www.dinatoriello.com. It is a mouthful. My apologies <laughs> for my Italian heritage. Um, so it's D E N A T A U R I E L L O dot com. Excellent. And all my info is there. And, uh, you know, I have some blogs and contact information. And if you're interested in lessons, I do lessons via Skype and all that fun stuff. So, you know, if anyone's interested, they can certainly reach out that way. Absolutely. I'd love to hear from anyone who wants to chat. Yeah, and we will make sure that we link up to you as well uh, when your episode goes live. Um, thank you so much, Dina. I really do appreciate thank it. Thank you. Again, you're welcome here anytime. Keep us posted, and when you land that next Broadway gig, come back and tell us all about it, okay? I, that's a deal. I would love it. Thanks, uh, Jamie. Fantastic. Have a great one, Dina. You too. All right, bye-bye. All right, everybody, that's going to wrap up episode 51 of the Drum Shuffle. My thanks go out to Dina for joining us today. Uh, what a great person, great interview. Uh, so thanks, Dina, for jumping on the show. We can't wait to have you back real soon. Guys, next week is going to be the 52nd weekly episode of the Drum Shuffle so we're really excited, going to celebrate our one-year anniversary with the great Rich Redmond. Rich is just everywhere, of course. Everybody knows him from Jason Aldean. He's also an actor, a voiceover artist, uh, author, clinician. Rich is just a great guy, so we're really excited to bring you uh, a great interview with Rich next week. Uh, we've got all kinds of cool stuff coming up. I'm going to be joined here in just a couple of weeks by Mike Johnston from Mike'sLessons.com. Uh, of course, the co-host of the biggest drum podcast out there, the Modern Drummer Podcast with Mike and Mike. Uh, so we're going to be joined by Mike Johnston uh, here in just a couple of weeks. Got all kinds of great stuff coming up. Jay Took from the Steel Woods. Uh, so please hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you prefer to listen to podcasts. Uh, you're not going to want to miss some of these episodes coming up. Thank you so much for tuning in. We really can't do any of this without every single one of you tuning in week after week. To that end, we love hearing from each and every one of you. Our email address is the drum shuffle podcast at gmail.com. Our web address is the drum shuffle.com. And of course, you can find more information about me over at jamieeds.com. Again, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, may your head stay strong and your sticks never break. Cheers. Cheers.